Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. And um, I've been spending a lot of time on this vitamin D issue. I'm going to keep talking about it until we make a dent in what's going on with vitamin D. I mean, it's prescribed for almost any and every condition these days. And if you talk to some health professionals, it would be hard to come up with a condition that vitamin D pills wouldn't make better. I mean, I just wish it was that simple. Life would be so great if for the people coming in here who have all kinds of stuff going on with their health, all they had to do is take a couple pills every day. But uh, studies continue to show that taking vitamin D doesn't improve anything but your blood work and the bank accounts of the doctors, the labs, and the supplement companies that benefit from this whole vitamin D craze. Well, I want to talk about two things related to this. One is another study that shows that this is a bad idea, and then how we may have descended into this vitamin D mess. So let's start with one common misconception is that taking vitamin D enhances calcium absorption. That's the rationale for giving it to a lot of women who are told they have osteoporosis and osteoporosis. I'm not going to go into all that. That's a whole other message we can talk about another day. But to test this theory, researchers conducted a dose response study on calcium absorption that included 198 white and African American women who had vitamin D levels lower than 20 nanograms per milliliter at baseline. The women were randomized in a double blind study to take 400, 800, 1600, or 2400 international units of vitamin D or a placebo and then they were all given calcium supplements to increase their intake from what was an average of 706 milligrams a day to over a thousand milligrams a day. Vitamin D levels averaged in the group about 13.4 at baseline and they did go up, particularly in the women taking the highest dose of 2400 international units a day. But after 12 months, there was no increase in calcium absorption in either white or African American women taking any dose of vitamin D, and there was no relationship between calcium absorption and final serum vitamin D levels. The researchers wrote, there's no need to recommend vitamin D for increasing calcium absorption in normal subjects. And so I, I think this has to be the 50th uh, research study I've reported about this vitamin D issue. So, with that in mind, and all the other studies I've talked about, why is it that so many people are being diagnosed with severe vitamin D deficiency? Why are all these studies failing to show a relationship between supplementation and better outcomes? Well, one of the problems, and I just started looking into this, and, and uh, it's one of those things where uh, you know, both curious and angry at the same time the more I read about it, the diagnostic parameters for vitamin D deficiency have changed. And this is a continuing trend in medicine, much in the same way that we've seen changing diagnostic parameters, uh, increasing the diagnoses of diabetes and hypothyroidism and hypertension. This strategy is really good for business because it turns healthy people into patients who require treatment. Now, I went back a little bit, and it wasn't all that long ago that vitamin D deficiency was defined as uh, serum levels below 10 nanograms per milliliter. But during the last several years, the definition has changed, and, and again, this is part of the disease mongering. Now it's defined by some health professionals as uh, deficiency is below 20, and we've invented this new thing called vitamin D insufficiency. That's a made-up disease and that's um, uh, levels under 30. Laboratory reference ranges reflect these new parameters. Now, let's talk about how good this is for business. Under the old definition, almost nobody was deficient. Under the new definition, almost everybody is. And in terms of the daily dose required to fix it, the daily dose needed to help most people achieve vitamin D levels of 20 is 800 international units, but the dose needed to achieve 30 is 4,000 international units a day. So if you're in the vitamin D business, this is a gold mine, but it's another reason, in my opinion, for healthy people to stay away from doctors and unnecessary testing. The system is now designed to make sure that almost everybody's gonna be diagnosed with something if you just get tested for enough things long enough. This results in two things. Healthy people become the worried well, thinking that something's wrong with them, and many of them undergo unnecessary treatment for literally imaginary conditions. So spend your time and energy eating well, exercising, and taking care of yourself, and save your doctor visits for when you're sick and there's really something wrong that you need to have checked out. The other issue, while we're talking about mythology and medicine, that could be a whole course that we teach here at Wellness Farm Health, mythology and medicine. 
Debate continues about dietary sodium. Now, some health professionals tend to villainize sodium and recommend that there be no added sodium in the diet. The American Heart Association recommends a low-sodium diet, 1,500 milligrams a day. But there's a large and growing body of evidence showing that extreme sodium restriction, which may be very important for a little tiny percentage of the population that's salt deficient, or salt sensitive, I should say, is really not a good idea for the general population. Furthermore, this is another one where trying to make complicated issues really simple. Um, the sodium issue has been presented as being really simple. Just eat less salt, your hypertension goes away. And it's actually more complicated than that, and it includes many other factors such as the total dietary pattern and the relationship of sodium intake to other minerals and nutrients like potassium in the diet. So in a prospective cohort study, researchers looked at the relationship between urinary excretion of sodium and potassium and the risk of major cardiovascular events and death. Urinary excretion is an indicator for intake. The study included over 101,000 people in 17 countries with, and this is interesting, at the beginning of the study, their sodium excretion on average was 4.93 grams per day, almost five grams a day. Potassium is excretion 2.12 grams per day. Now, higher sodium excretion defined as seven grams or more, that's pretty high intake, was associated with a 15% increase in the risk of major cardiovascular and death and events as compared with sodium excretion of four to 5.99 grams per day, which is considered the reference range for purposes of this study. So 15% increase if you were in, in major events or death at, at seven grams or more. But listen to this. Um, if, your, if your sodium excretion was under three grams a day, indicating lower intake, it was associated with a 27% increase in major, major cardiovascular events and death. Higher potassium excretion was, um, was also associated with lower risk of events. So the researchers concluded that intake of three to six grams a day was associated with a lower risk of death and, and cardiovascular events. And then at the very low end, which for purposes of this study was less than three, or very high end, more than six, you saw an increase in events, but it was actually worse if you were at the low end of restriction than uh, the higher end of overconsumption. It's worth noting that average salt consumption in this huge cohort in 17 countries was over three times the amount of sodium recommended by the American Heart Association and other health authorities which collectively continue to re recommend sodium intake that is less than that of the, the consumption of 99.9% .9 of the population on the planet. Now, it is true that some people are salt sensitive. They either hold water or they do have hypertension related to salt intake, and those people should restrict sodium. But uh, this is turning into another example of the medical profession's tendency to take something that actually benefits a tiny percentage of the population and apply it to everybody, you know? And I, I always use the example of alcohol. Alcoholics should have no alcohol, not a single drop, because if they're gonna have a drop, they're gonna have a gallon of it. People who don't have an alcohol problem, preaching to them about abstinence is an exercise in futility. So I'm, this is kind of the same issue. It's also worth noting that increasing potassium intake is important and protective. High potassium foods include foods you should eat, like potatoes and sweet potatoes and other plant foods. All potatoes are high potassium foods. When people convert to a well-structured plant-based diet, like the one we recommend here at Wellness Forum Health, what happens is their potassium intake goes up, their sodium intake goes down because the sodium is uh, principally found in animal foods, lots in dairy. Unsalted dairy is barely palatable, by the way. Try it sometime, you'll see what I mean. And then all the processed foods. So when that stuff starts being reduced or gotten rid of, sodium intake goes down. For most people, further restriction isn't necessary. And in view of this and many other studies that I have been talking about and are posted in the Health Brace Library, may not be advisable. All right, so um, the bottom line is stay away from the doctors. Don't get your vitamin D tested. Don't take vitamin D supplements. Don't restrict sodium unless you clearly know that you're a candidate for sodium restriction. Eat a wellness form, health style diet. Sodium will go down, pot potassium will go up. All's well with the world. All right, that's it for today. It for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Tuesday with more news.